Yeah, I, you, you think that speakers, when they come, they always make a comment like that and say the worship team was great. But actually, your worship team was great this morning. That was really, really powerful worship and was a real, real blessing. And thank you for that introduction. Um, you sit there listening to these things, thinking, who writes this stuff? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I think it was something that someone in my office wrote. They say lots of kind things about me because I have to pay their salaries. <laughs> Great. I just want to say a couple of things before we turn to the Word. Um, and it really is a joy to be here and to get to know you all. Um, as was sort of intimated, I've, I've just last year completed 50 years in ministry. So, so don't worry, that doesn't mean I'm the Ancient of Days and I'm not going to make it to the end of the service. I actually started when I was an 18-year-old as a youth pastor in a church down in Brighton and Hove at a time when we had some real challenges down there. Football hooliganism had just begun. So at a Saturday football match, if you asked who won, you'd probably get told who won the fight on the terraces rather than who won the game on the pitch because that was the sort of atmosphere. And also back in those days in the 60s, we were having a lot of fights on the beach in Brighton during the summer uh, between two sets of rivals, the, uh, the, the mods we used to call them, who used to arrive on their, their motor scooters with these uh, fur-lined Parker jackets. And they would sort of beat the living daylights out of the rockers who turned up in their leather jackets. And I was running a youth club just a short distance away from there. So in the summer, I'd get the overspill of the fights from the beaches. And then in the uh, winter, I'd get the spillover from the fights that were taking place on the football terraces. So actually, you know, it's a joy these days to pe speak to people who sit still and don't throw chairs at each other and don't hit others with my motorcycle chains. I actually got quite good in those days that um, one of the tricks they learned, particularly in the winter, was they found the main power switch for the building that we were meeting in so that they could plunge the building into darkness so that they could carry on their fights. I got quite good at crawling along the floor and turning the power back on and calming them all down again so that we could have an epilogue in the youth club. And, and one of the most incredible things, I've never forgotten this, that, that in the most unlikely situations, God can move. And, you know, there were times when a pin could have dropped when we were sharing the word of God. And although there was all this rivalry going on, you could see that when people got right with God, they got right with one another. And it was such a privilege, really, to sort of begin ministry in that environment. It hasn't continued like that. I've seen all sorts of different things over the years and uh, seen things happen in different ways. But one of the things I did want to mention to you was that, um, I don't know whether you were aware of this, but as we were approaching the year 2000, um, the, the nations of the world started setting what were called Millennium Development Goals. They've just expired and they've tried to replace them with another lot, having not fulfilled the first ones, but that's the way that government works. If you didn't do it first time, sweep it under the carpet and do something different. But the churches also came up with Millennium Goals. And one of the Millennium Goals that was put forward in the 1990s, that there should be a culturally relevant church within everyone's reach worldwide. And that seemed to be such a huge goal. Just imagine having an Emirati church in the Emirates. I mean, I preach in the Emirates, but you don't preach to Emiratis. You preach to all the other people that happen to live in there. You know, when you go to Saudi Arabia, it's almost impossible to have church. But that goal of having a, a culturally relevant church within everyone's reach worldwide was something that I felt was so important that I started saying to God, how are you going to do it? And to my utter amazement, God said to me, I already am. And I just stopped and I thought, every country I go to in the world, there are eager church planters, not necessarily trained, but people that are passionate to see churches raised up in their communities. And Everywhere I was going, I was hearing governments and church leaders speak about these churches in a negative way. In certain African countries, they were known as the mushroom churches because they would spring up overnight. <laughs> and they were being written off. And then I said to God, so that's you that's doing that. And I had that assurance in my heart that God was saying, yes, that is me. And so I thought, 
God, I've got to facilitate this, not stop this. And so I suppose my big passion, really, you know, okay, there was Christian TV and there was all sorts of other things and national campaigns and, I, you know, some of you probably don't know because I normally hide in the background. So National Day of Prayer and Worship at uh, Wembley Stadium, I was the chair for that. And so all of these kind of things have been in the background. But the thing that really is stirring me up at the moment is that God is raising up churches everywhere. And we need to facilitate that. So a lot of what I do at the moment is to try and win respect from the church leaders and the governments around the world so that these churches, such as this one, <laughs> have got room to grow and flourish and function and be respected and make an impact. Because, you know, this is where a lot of the life is today. You know, they made me this free churches moderator. You probably don't know what that means. But basically, you can divide the churches in this country into Anglican, Catholic, and the rest. The rest are called the free churches. So the Baptists, the Methodists, the United Reformed Church, Salvation Army, the Pentecostal churches. So the Archbishop of Canterbury looks after the Anglicans. The Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster looks after the Catholics. And I have to look after the rest. So... <laughs> So that's quite a big challenge. But it's a huge privilege because it gives me an opportunity to be able to say the biggest growth sector at the moment in the church around the world is within this independent Pentecostal sector. God is just doing something. And, and, and the likes of us, you know, I mean, people think, oh, you've got all these theological qualifications. I didn't have a single theological qualification when I started church planting. I've played catch-up since to look respectable. But when I started off, I'd been to Bible college. I could read, fortunately, so I knew what the Bible said. But, and, I hadn't, and I hadn't had anyone teach me how to misunderstand it, which was also a great blessing, because sometimes that's what happens. But just to see what God is doing at the moment is absolutely incredible. And the way that God is using different diaspora communities. And just, I mean, it's been a huge privilege for me. I, I, I don't know whether some of you know this, but um, I suppose one of the big advantages for me was that uh, when I'd sort of finished medical training and everything else, I was going to be a missionary. And uh, because I, I, I prayed and I said, God, you know, I want to serve you and speak to me. And God spoke to me from that verse which said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And I kept saying to him, but and the rest, you know, and to God the things that are God's. But he kept saying to me, no, you've got to give back for what you've had out. And of course, in those days, you received your, your university education in this country for free. And I just had six years of training at government expense, and I was going to walk away from it all. And God said to me, you can't do that. You've got to render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, as well as to God the things that are God's. And so I went off and I worked in, I, I wanted to do maxillofacial surgery, so I did a, a bit of that in some London teaching hospitals. And, and then I had this great idea. I thought, I can solve everything. I can render to Caesar and render to God at the same time if I go and become a missionary in Africa. So I found a place where they were looking for someone to work in a medical center, and by this time I'd married the sister off the intensive care unit. Always a good idea to find the right person. <laughs> And, and we were going to go out to Zambia. Our churches had, had bid us a fond farewell. <laughs> we, were all, we knew where we were going and what we were going to do and everything. And then, this was 1971, they declared a whole reorganization <laughs> in Zambia. And the World Bank got involved, all sorts of things got involved. And the little project that we were going to suddenly lost all its funding. And I was thinking, but God, I'm meant to be a missionary to Africa. And then someone came along and gave me one of those prophetic words you can never possibly understand. They said, I don't think God wants you to go to Africa. He will send Africa to you. I thought, what a weird thing to say. <laughs> now, I, I am not responsible for all the African immigration that has taken place since 1970. <laughs> But there is a sense in which my life has been transformed. And funny enough, some of the things that they taught us in preparation for going to Africa have been absolutely invaluable in receiving people from Africa. Because, you know, they were sending me out to Africa 
just when all the colonial stuff had stopped and everyone was being independent. And so they said to us that we're going, they said, now under no circumstances do you go there like the former colonial power. You don't go in there to tell anyone how to do anything. As far as you're concerned, from now on, they're in charge and you serve them. And that meant that that freed me up. <laughs> it freed me up to just be in any culture and learn from where they're at. Because one of the big mistakes you can make is to try and turn people into where you've come from instead of immerse yourself in where you are. So God's been an incredible blessing and it's been a, a real privilege. And you don't know how much I enjoy being in church like this on a Sunday. And uh, I spend most of my time these days in church like this. Um, for 50 years in ministry, my, my staff team came up with a great suggestion. They said, let's, st let's stop making any money from what you do, um, and let's give it all away for nothing. And so that's what we've done uh, pretty well. So everything that I've done on radio TV is now available for free download on my website, so you don't have to pay anything for that now. Uh, there's loads and loads and loads of stuff there. We've made it all uh, MP3 download. I know there is such a thing as MP5, but at the moment that would take up most people's whole battery on their mobile phone and memory and everything else. But feel free, just go there. There's cards at the back. You can pick that up. You can just get anything you want off the website for free. Um, obviously, if you want to partner with us in that project, then do. Obviously, we're doing it through financial partners now rather than giving, but you feel free to do that. And uh, we, we also have got some books. I've just brought this one out called The Power of Purity. Um, you know, I think some of us have experienced heavy-handed holiness, you know, which, which isn't really holiness at all. It's just a bunch of rules and regulations which uh, tie you up in knots without liberating you into Jesus. Uh, but there is a power of purity in God which can come into our lives and transform us. So this isn't a book about just telling you get your life in order. This is a book that looks at who God is, what God can do, and how he can transform us in the process. So it says five pounds on the back, but um, I'm going to take a risk here. We, we do it for three pounds today. Okay, so if you want that, three pounds. Um, and I apologize because they've given me this new sophisticated card machine that only works if I'm in an area where I know the password for the local Wi-Fi. So it's no use at all <laughs> in most places. So it'd have to be cash only. Is that okay today? Um, so three pounds for that if you, you would like that and that would be a joy to give that. I think there's, there's plenty there. If you run out whoever's serving at the table at the back, there's a lot more in the box underneath. So if you get stuck, come and, come and ask me. Now, the theme for this conference. You were inspired. Pastor Joel, Pastor America, you were inspired. What a title for a conference. Open Heavens Conference. Because that's what we need. We need to be in a place where we're ministering under an open heaven. And I know that over the last few days, God's been inspiring you with that thought of just being under an open heaven. And I'm just trusting this morning that I can just add something that will help set a seal on all the things that God has already worked in this conference so far. So I'm going to turn to a passage of scripture which you may have looked at in previous sessions, but I, I want to draw out one or two things that God has really spoken to me from this. It's Luke chapter 3. It's just a few verses from Luke chapter 3. And whilst you're finding it, I do need to apologize that I won't be able to stay to lunch. And having had a look in there and seen what you've got, you are going to be blessed. I mean, I have... I almost changed my mind when I saw some of the dessert. But, uh, no, my daughter is down from Newcastle, so I've got to go home and uh, eat with the family this lunchtime. Which means that if you are going to buy one of those books or pick up one of those cards, can you do it before you eat your lunch? Because otherwise it will be gone. <laughs> of course, I'll be gone. Okay, so that's given you a chance to find Luke chapter 3. I'm only going to read a few verses from here. I just want to read 21, 22, and 23 from Luke chapter 3. Very well-known words. 
And it says this. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. Now, an open heaven means many things. But one thing it does indicate is that you can come into constant communion with God. You know, forget the sky and the clouds and think of heaven as the dwelling place of God. And when there's an open heaven, God is saying, now there can be constant communion between me and you. You're living in a relationship where there is no barrier. It's not a case of when I pray the heavens are like brass. <laughs> it's when I pray, it's as if I'm whispering in the very ear of God the Father. I know sometimes in African circles when we pray, um, if God wasn't dead when we started, he probably is by the time we finished. <laughs> because we're under the impression that if we don't pray loud, we don't get hurt. But I know there are times when you know too, that just a whisper is enough. I think sometimes we pray loud to scare the devil away, really, rather than to get hold of God. But just to have that ability to know that I don't need to say it a thousand times because when I said it once, he heard. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't sort of hammer home the message. But doesn't it make a difference when you just know that there's constant communion? I was asked a question at a conference the other week, um, and the question was this. This person was very honest. He said, sometimes I manage to live my life with eternity in view. But a lot of the time, I just can't hold that in my head. How do you cope with your Christian life? That's the kind of question you get asked sometimes, you know. And most speakers try and hide away at that point and give a theoretical answer. And I said, well, actually, it's not constantly reminding myself of eternity. It's actually living in that intimacy with God on a day-by-day -day basis, which is so important, isn't it? So open heaven is a picture of constant communion. Now, it's true that there are plenty of passages in Scripture before you get to this where it talks about an open heaven. But I can tell you that this day when heaven opened, it had never been opened like that before. And in a sense, it opened in a way that was never going to shut. <laughs> there was something incredible about this moment when heaven opened. And I just want to bring out some simple things. There's a sense in which it opened because Jesus prayed. It opened so that the Holy Spirit could descend. And it opened so that the Father could speak. So within this little passage of Scripture, you can see something that is so important. You can see the obedience of the Son as he prayed. You can see the descent of the Spirit as he came. And you can hear the voice of the Father as he spoke. Now, I know that Jesus, from the moment that he arrived as a baby was never out of communion with his father. I know that's quite hard to imagine, but because Jesus was fully human. You know, when you sing that Christmas carol, Little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes, don't you believe that? He cried like any other baby, all right? He was, he was fully human. I mean, if you'd, if you'd had one that never cried, you'd have probably wanted to send it back. I know some of us want to send them back when they cry, but actually, if you've got one that never cried, you'd think there's something wrong with this one. <laughs> so Jesus was fully human. And even as a little baby, you know, he would cry, he would express his needs. But somehow, even when he was expressing needs, because that's the only language babies got, isn't it, really? <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, I want mum. <laughs> Same word. You know, you're meant to be able to interpret it all, aren't you? But somehow, when Jesus cried... The father was hearing. 
and realized that this was all part of the willingness of his son to surrender to this just amazing, isn't it? To think that, that God Almighty was prepared to come as a human baby. And then when he grew up and he was amongst his friends, and he was just like the other boys, you know? He probably kicked a ball around or a stone around or something around on the streets. He would play with those friends. He wasn't some sort of standoffish character. He didn't come all the way from heaven to avoid us. <laughs> he came all the way from heaven to involve with us. And he'd have been involved with those lads. And yet, he also had this moment when he was on his own, he would just talk to the father. That's a 12-year-old. He's in the temple. And he's talking to the, the chief people who know the law. And he's asking them difficult questions. And then his mother comes to find him and says, do you not know that your father and I were worried about you? And Jesus was very careful. He had a huge respect for Joseph, who he knew wasn't his father. <laughs> and he said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? <laughs> now, he was very gracious. He also went about his, uh, what you call, stepfather's business as well, didn't he? <laughs> In that he was prepared to work as a carpenter. But even whilst he was working as a carpenter, his heart was set on his father's business. And he was living in constant communion with the Father, even as he was growing up. But it was private. It was private. It was just those moments when, you know, maybe he was sent to collect the water from the stream. Because I know what it's like, you know. I mean, people think that it's very easy to find personal space. Some of you have lived in Africa. I, I, when I go, I think, how does anyone find personal space? You know, particularly if you're in a rural community. You know, you don't have your own personal space. Your bedroom, you share it with five siblings, you know. And when it's meal time, you just say, I'm just going to have my quiet time now. What was one of those? <laughs> the only time you get that is when you're, you're doing something and deliberately setting an opportunity to talk to God in your heart and your mind and just worship him on your own. And it was like that for Jesus growing up. He, he didn't sort of disappear off somewhere unless he got up before the break of day, <laughs> just to have those moments with his, with his father. Very ordinary. But now we come to this moment, and he knows he's waited 30 years. I always think it's funny. You know, these days they train people for three years and launch them on 30 years of ministry. <laughs> but with Jesus, he trained for three, 30 years just at home, and then launched on three years of ministry. A little bit of different scale there, isn't there, somewhere? But because he was ministering life. And, and this day, he, he knew. He knew who John the Baptist was. He was his cousin, but he knew that he was the one who'd been sent before. He knew all of these things. And he knew that the moment was right for his public ministry to begin. Now, how did he decide to begin his public ministry? I, it wasn't a case of, let's put a big placard up, you know, in the middle of Nazareth, public ministry begins today. John the Baptist had been sent to prepare the way of the Lord. And he was preparing the way of the Lord by bringing down the mountains of unbelief and lifting up the valleys where there had been doubt. And he was getting straight paths. And Jesus knew that in order to fulfill all righteousness, having come to identify with us, he had to identify with us even in going through that water of baptism. So he comes. It scares John silly, because he looks and he knows immediately. He thinks, hold on. He'd never seen his cousin in this light before, even though when his mother visited his mother, <laughs> something had happened on the inside of Elizabeth, and John had been filled with the Holy Spirit, even <laughs> through the presence of Jesus when he was still just a fetus in his mother's womb. That is incredible. But there was still this sense in John, is he the one? And then Jesus comes and he gets into the water, and John says, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. 
But Jesus is so full of humility that when he is being baptized, he's actually talking to the Father. It says in Luke's Gospel that as he was baptized, he prayed. He was fulfilling all obedience, okay? He was being obedient. <laughs> and we know that for us, God gives us the Holy Spirit when we obey. He doesn't give the Holy Spirit to disobedient people. And so here's Jesus. He's, he's obedient and he's talking to the Father. Now, obviously, the Father can have a conversation with the Son without any problem at all. They've been talking to each other for 30 years and they were talking to other, each other for eternity before that. I mean, there have been agreements in God that go way, way back. Actually, the decision for Jesus to lay down his life for us was taken at the foundation of the world. So that's how far back. I mean, conversations have been going back before time began. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Till I... Every now and then we get a little glimpse in Scripture of a conversation that had taken place in heaven. But now there's a conversation on earth. And Jesus is speaking as he's praying, talking to the Father. And because Jesus is praying publicly, the Father responds publicly. He opens heaven. And everyone can see that heaven is open. And it wasn't just that heaven was open so that the Holy Spirit could get out. You know, as if heaven was closed and, you know, it's like opening a cage and now the Holy Spirit can come. No, it was that everyone needed to see the level of communion that existed between Jesus and his Father. And people saw heaven opened. I don't know what it looked like. But at the very least, it would have been like great rays of sunshine coming down. Clouds swept away. Just suddenly you just realize this was a unique moment. Heaven had opened before, but heaven had never opened like this before. People had been coming to be baptized by John. And when you were baptized by John, it wasn't that pleasant. Because he would say, before I baptize you, you've got to stand here and confess your sins. So you'd be standing there, I did this, and then I did that, and then I did something else. And when you got the whole list, he said, now we'll wash them away. And he baptized you. When Jesus came, he had nothing to confess. Absolutely nothing to confess. But you know, even when the people had confessed, and they had their sins washed away by John, it wasn't a permanent transformation. Because John had had to say on one occasion, he said, people are coming to me that they might be baptized, but God wants to lay the axe to the root. Have you ever realized there's a difference between confessing sins and confessing sin? When you confess sins, it's like taking all the rotten apples off the tree one by one. And here comes another one, and here comes another one, and here comes another one. But when you realize that the reason there are rotten apples on the tree is because it's a rotten tree... <laughs> You stop picking apples off the tree and you find an axe to lay to the root. And Jesus came to lay the axe to the root and to say, the wrong tree goes and we're going to establish a new tree, tree of life in your life. And so when Jesus is being baptized, this is the first time anyone's come out of that water sin-free <laughs> because he went into it sin-free. <laughs> The spotless Lamb of God. <laughs> and heaven opens. Opened in a way that it didn't open for any other baptismal candidates of John. <laughs> it was great for them to be prepared for what was to come. But John said, I baptize you in water. But there's one who's coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fan is in his hand. Now, we don't even know what a winnowing fan is these days, you know. But what it is, is an implement they use on the threshing floor. Once they've threshed all the grain, you need to sort the wheat from the chaff. And so what you would do, you would have these long barns, and you'd open the door at one end, and you'd open the door at the other, and the evening breeze would blow through, and you would toss the grain on the winnowing fan. And all the chaff would get blown away in the through draft. But all the grain would stay, and you'd just end up with a pile of grain, and the chaff would be blown away. That's what God does to us when he comes in the power of his spirit. 
And he comes with fire. Now we need baptizing with fire. Because there's a lot of dross to burn up in our lives. Just as there's a lot of chaff that has to be get rid of so that you can get rid of the grain, there's a lot of dross that has to go before you get to the gold. And so he baptizes us with fire. And when the Holy Spirit comes to us, he comes as fire to cleanse us from sin. But when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he didn't come as fire, he came as a dove. He came as a dove. Because a dove can rest upon the Lamb. <laughs> and so we're beginning to see just how unique this open heaven moment is. There's an open heaven moment when there's prayerful obedience. And there's a yearning in your heart which says, I want communion with God. There's a lot of us praying for an open heaven because we think it would be great to do miracles. Oh, if I had an open heaven, whoa, you know, I could, I could do this, I could do that, I could do the other. And God says, yeah, that's great. But that's not the real reason why I want to give you an open heaven. Hmm? You know, you've, you've read what it says in, in Malachi where it says if you bring the tithes into the storehouse... He will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. And some people say, I want an open heaven because I want that blessing that nothing can contain, you know? Well, we need those things. But the real reason God wants to open heaven is so that you can have constant communion with him. The rest will come out of that. You know, the healing ministry will come out of that. The financial blessing can come out of that. But I would give up the financial blessing and the miracle ministry to have the constant communion. Amen. The good news is, with constant communion, you don't have to give up anything. <laughs> because when you get that, you get the very essence of what it's all about. Because you're no longer ministering in your own power. Everything flows out of that constant communion. You know, some people say, I, I want a prophetic ministry. No, what you need is a listening ear. Because if you can hear what the Father's saying, you can tell people what God is saying. Amen. That's a prophetic ministry. Amen. It's just a listening ear, isn't it, really? There's a lot of people saying, I don't know what to say. Well, listen to the one who's meant to be speaking. Uh, there was a funny moment in a meeting. There was, a, there was a, a young lad who had some educational difficulties in the meeting. And someone who, who was noted for giving lengthy prophecies in meeting was prophesying. And he always gave a gloomy prophecy. <laughs> and this prophecy was, I am so fed up with you, my people, that I have decided I have left the building. I have gone now. And, and this young lad with the educational problem said, if he's left the building, who is it talking to us then? <laughs> Prophetic ministry comes out of a connection. It comes out of constant communion. We want to hear the voice of God. That's what prophetic ministry is. So we need constant communion. But we also need something else that happened that was remarkable that day. Because John had had a word from God which said, when you see the Holy Spirit descend upon someone and remain. Those two words, and remain, were the real key. You see, heaven had opened before, and the Spirit had descended on people. And they would prophesy. Spirit even descended on Saul, and he prophesied. But the Spirit never remained. <laughs> now, we do find people in the Old Testament, which it is quite remarkable, how faithful God was in sticking around. However, I am amazed that David was able to say in Psalm 51, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. You'd have thought after murder and adultery, the Holy Spirit would have long gone. But the Holy Spirit sticks around because he comes to convict us of sin. You see, if the Holy Spirit goes, who's going to convict you of sin? Your neighbor's not going to manage it. The preacher's not going to manage it. The preacher's going to hammer away and say, you need to repent, 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 repent. But if there's nothing on the inside of you that's producing that repentance, so the Holy Spirit sticks around even when we get it wrong so that he can bring conviction of sin into our lives. 
And you do know the difference between conviction and condemnation. Because the devil, he always wants to condemn. You get something wrong, he'll turn up and say, you got that wrong, you know. You got it really wrong. There's no hope now. You're finished. And sometimes people, young Christians, would say, what's the difference between condemnation and conviction? See, when the devil condemns, there's no hope. He never speaks hope. But when the Holy Spirit convicts, he always speaks hope. He says, you got it wrong, but... <laughs> when the devil comes, he says, you got it wrong, and... <laughs> Isn't it good that the Holy Spirit comes and says it doesn't have to stay like that? But it's incredible that from the moment that the Spirit descended on Jesus, we entered an era where the Holy Spirit will remain. It was a prelude to what Jesus was going to say. That when the Comforter comes, he's going to do all of these things. And it's good that I go away, because when he comes, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. Sometimes people say, wouldn't it be great to go and walk where Jesus walked? Yeah, it probably would. You'll get some sand in your shoes and a few other things, but it's actually better to walk with the one whom Jesus walked with <laughs> than to walk in the place where Jesus walked. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes. And so when the Holy Spirit descended like a dove from heaven, it was because the Holy Spirit, you know, he didn't, some people said, you know, did, did God the Father send the Spirit at that particular point? The Holy Spirit couldn't stop himself. You know, he, he, it was just like the Father just opened heaven <laughs> because of this public awareness now that there's constant communion. And the Holy Spirit just had to come and rest upon the Lord Jesus. But then the father had to speak. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Another occasion, this is my beloved son, hear him. And somehow, that voice from heaven is just so important. Now that was a public voice. But every one of us needs to know that private voice as well, speaking in our hearts. And the Father wants to speak that into your life. We, we're living under an open heaven. We're living in a day that this began. One of the things you need to understand in the Bible is that a day doesn't necessarily mean 24 hours. You know? We, I know, I know. I, I go around the world and everyone sings, this is the day, this is the day. And normally we're told, this is the day, the 1st of May, you know, 2016. This is the day the Lord has made. Yeah, I know he's made. You know, we're still here, so he's definitely made the 1st of May, 2016. But actually, when you find that verse in the Old Testament, this is the day that the Lord has made, it's not referring to a 24-hour period. It says, the stone that the builders have rejected have become the chief cornerstone. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So what are we rejoicing in? Well, not because it's the 1st of May, although you can, and in England in the past they used to dance around maypoles and ribbons and all strange things on the 1st of May, so we've been delivered from all of that, hallelujah. But, but the good news is this, we don't rejoice in the date, we rejoice in the fact we live at a time when the stone the builders rejected has been made the chief cornerstone. And that means that anyone who the builders reject is capable of being lifted up. So it doesn't matter how many times people said, you're not fit, you can't do it, and all the rest of it. Just know, we're living in a day where the stone that the builders have rejected can be made the chief cornerstone. And God has chosen the things that are nothing to bring to nothing the things that are. That's the power of our God. So we live at a time when <laughs> what people consider to be the natural order of things is reversed by the power of the Holy Spirit. When the unexpected <laughs> end up being first. <laughs> and those who expected to be first find themselves at the back of the line very often. That is good goodness of God. And this is what it means to be under an open heaven. From the day that heaven opened here, 
there's a sense in which a whole new era was ushered in. And we don't have to think to ourselves, oh my goodness, did heaven really open? It really opened because Jesus came. It really opened because he was prepared to take our place. And to join that line where people were being baptized, confessing their sins. And he who had no sin identified with us. But he didn't just come and have sin washed away. He came to lay the axe to the root so that we could have a total new experience in him. Heaven's open. Heaven's open. It's so exciting to think that God right now is able to communicate with every one of us. He can speak into our hearts, can speak into our lives. His sheep know his voice. Now don't get to the point where you think, well, now I know his voice, I don't need to read his word. <clears throat> you need to read his word so that you can hear his voice more clearly. <laughs> that's how you find out his accent. That's how you find out the things he's interested in. That's how you find out where his emphasis lies. And then he underscores it by what he speaks into your heart and into your life. But there's an open heaven. There's constant communion for us. And on that basis, what are we going to see? What are we going to see? What's Balm of Gilead going to see? I think you're going to see so much. I, I, I am amazed at what God has done. I mean, this is brilliant. I was preaching in Chapel Heath last Sunday as well. You'd be surprised. Not very far from here. <laughs> but when I see what God is doing here, it excites my heart. And I think it's just the beginning of what God wants to do. And I don't want to lay any great burden on Pastor Joel and Pastor America, but I'm sure God's going to do so, so, so much more. And the caliber of people that God has brought into this place, it is extraordinary. You are living under an open heaven. <laughs> you, you are a blessed people. You know, there, there is a, a sense of constant communion. You know, when, when, when Pastor Joel shared that word about that which is flowing and the anointing that's flowing, that comes because someone is sensitive to what the Spirit of God's doing. And that sensitivity is in this place. The Spirit of God wants to come in even greater power on people's lives. And if he has to come as the fire to burn up the dross, that's great. <clears throat> He can still minister his love and his healing to us. And I, I, I got used to building with burnt bricks. You know, when you read <coughs> the book of Nehemiah, they rebuilt the city with burnt bricks. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't matter what you've been through. <coughs> God can still build you in and take the stone the builders rejected and make it the chief cornerstone. But somewhere in the midst of all of this, you just need to know God speaking into your heart too. <coughs> And saying, you're my child. You're my child. Now, it's not the same as the way he said it to Jesus. <clears throat> we didn't have all that pre-existence. We didn't come from heaven. We started here. But we can still become his children by adoption and grace. And he wants to speak into our hearts and say, you're my child. You're my child. And I want you to know this. That the testimony he has of you is more powerful than any testimony you might have of him. <clears throat> you see, people will stand up and they say, you know, this is my testimony. But this day, it was the father who gave his testimony, wasn't it? Speaking over the life of his son. This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. So, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm believing that God is going to do some incredible things. <clears throat> and I want to pray for you as a church. I want to pray for you as individuals because I believe that some of you just need to have a greater assurance in your heart. I believe that God does want to speak into your life and to say, you're my child. I'm pleased with you. <clears throat> There's an open heaven over your life. You're no longer sort of just speaking against a, a ceiling that's of bronze. <laughs> The day that I spoke over my son, the father of Sam, heaven opened in a way. 
because the barrier between man and God was removed. There was no need for the barrier anymore. There was a, a purity in Jesus that meant that there could be constant communion. And God wants to bring that purity into our hearts and lives and for us to know that communion too. So I want to pray for you as individuals because I believe that there are some that need that assurance in their heart that God is speaking, that God is able to, to bring that purity and that confidence into your life so that you know. But I also want to pray for you as a church because I, I sense that God is going to do something remarkable. I don't know where you're going to put everybody, but well, that's, a, that's God's problem. <coughs> but <coughs> what I do sense here <coughs> is that you have an amazing number of Timothys. <coughs> you have so many rising ministries in this place. <coughs> Just so many. <laughs> well, the moment I came in, I just had this sense that, that God has got people serving apprenticeships in this place. And I, wa I want to say to those of you who've <laughs> who, who, who sense the call of God on your life, this is a great place to serve an apprenticeship. It is a great place to serve an apprenticeship. <laughs> And that from that which you're serving here, God will open up many things. And there will come a point, you know, you've seen leaves fall off the tree in autumn. Do you know before every leaf comes off that tree, the tree is already healed underneath. <clears throat> so there is a place of release that doesn't require a rending or a ripping or a breaking or a tearing. There comes a point when there's a release. And I want to tell you this as well. I see a picture of this church as a tree. I see fruit. I see blossom. But I see leaves falling off the tree. Not like autumn when all the leaves come off the tree. <laughs> but it's like a few come off here and a few come off there. Because I, I think this is an amazing way. This, isn't a, th th this tree doesn't go through winter. <laughs> It's, it's, it's like a tree that is always in leaf, always in bloom, always in fruit. But even as you're looking at that, the fruit's getting picked, the blossom is being appreciated, and leaves are falling off. But when the leaves are falling off, they're carried to the nations. Yeah. Just as in the book of Revelation, where the leaves come off the tree and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. And there's a river... There's a river that's flowing through this place that will carry those leaves to be the healing of the nations. And I didn't expect to say all this, but sometimes, you know, nations are going to be healed through the ministry of this church. I mean, there's one that obviously comes to mind, a nation that needs to be healed. But it's not the only nation that needs to be healed. And you will see Zimbabwe healed. And, and, and some of the people that are going to be used for the healing of that nation will be leaves from this tree. Will be leaves from this tree. And some of you are going to be not sent to nations. You're going to be sent to places where you never expected to go. Some of you are going to be carried by the river of God's grace into positions in government Amen. in this country. Amen. Some of you are going to have significant positions Amen. in the health service, in other government departments, in local authorities, in multinational corporations. So don't, so don't feel that you've got to break off the tree. <laughs> There'll come a point when there is a release and the leaf can be carried to bring healing and all manner of things that God can bring. This is an amazing place to be. I think God is looking with his favor 
So you don't have to expect open heaven to express itself in quite the ways that some people expect. Oh, I know some churches were pissed. If there was an open heaven here, we'd have had the budget to have built a big multi-castle, this, the rest of it. There is an open heaven. There is an open heaven. And the, and the real evidence of that open heaven is, the, is that constant communion. That residing of the Holy Spirit. That speaking of the Father into people's hearts which says, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You're my daughter, I'm pleased with you. And the result of that is that the tree becomes healthy. Becomes a tree of life. And the people that grow through this place will grow with that life and can be released with that life. You know, I could start pointing people out and doing personal prophecies, but there are too many of you. There are too many of you to do that. All I can say is that some of you, I was in a meeting once, and uh, there was a massive meeting with lots of personal prophecies. And, and friends of mine were being called out, you know, sort of national leaders. Is so-and-so here? And, and prophetic word. And I was sitting there saying, God, I want a personal prophetic word. And then God said to me, what do you want me to say to you? So I said to him, well, I want you to say this, this, and this to me. He says, well, you already know it, so why do you need someone to say it? <laughs> and I think this is a day where all I need to say to some of you is, what you've been hearing in your heart is what God wants to say to you. And you don't necessarily have to wait until someone gives you a personal prophetic word. If God has spoken it in your heart, he will find ways of confirming that word in your life. So I want, I want you to stand. Let's all stand. And you can appropriate this prayer in whatever way you want for yourself personally. But once I've prayed the personal prayer, I'm going to pray for Balm of Gilead right here in Romford. Father, you know as we stand before you, we're all part of something that you're doing, which is amazing. Some of us are buds that are waiting to come into blossom. Some of us are blossom that are waiting to come into fruit. Some are leaves that are about to be released for the healing of the nations and for ministering into places where people don't expect to go, but where the river of life can carry them. Lord, as we stand before you, there are all these different stages. But Lord, we know today that an open heaven means constant communion. That there is a point when the Holy Spirit comes and remains and dwells with us. Not just comes to God. And we know too that there is a speaking from your throne into our hearts which can say, you are my child. I love you. I care for you. I want to use your life. And Lord, right now, under this open heaven, Lord, I just declare that each one of us will have ears to hear and hearts to receive and a willingness to let you work in our lives, that we won't abort that fruit-yielding process. And that if there's anyone here who needs to know the axe laid to the root so that there can be a fresh beginning, bring that fresh beginning today, Lord. Bring that fresh beginning. Because of the power and the fullness of what you did on that day when you went into that water and was baptized and your public ministry began, and the Father opened heaven, the Spirit descended, and you spoke into that situation. And Lord, right now I pray over this church. Lord, I pray that every attack of the enemy on it will fail. Because Lord, I know that this is a fruitful tree from which there's going to be blessing that flows out to the nations. I pray, Lord, for everyone who's in this place now, knowing that they've been placed here for purpose that is yet to be fulfilled. I pray, Lord, that you'll put patience into everybody's heart and that they will know how to draw the sap of this tree into their lives so that they can go from strength to strength and be so effectively raised up by you. I pray, Lord, for there to be a spirit of patience that no one rends themselves or rips themselves away before that moment of readiness for you to release them. I pray that there will be a perfect work done in every heart and every life. I pray, Lord, that there will be people right now, Lord, that you, you can see and, and you know that they're going to be used of you to bring healing into various situations. 
healing into nations, healing into workplaces. Lord, we yield ourselves to you. Lord, this isn't about us. It's about a needy world that needs your life. Lord, we don't want to see nations healed so that we can get the credit and come to church on a Sunday morning and say, another nation healed through Balm of Gilead. We, we're not interested in the credit. We just want to see the transformation in the nations. Lord, we'd rather release people so that they can go and do the work than hold on to them and see the work aborted. So, Lord, we just come now and we give this world to you. We just pray, Lord, that you'll use everything that we are, that the flow through this place will be so impactful that communities are changed by the power of your Spirit. So, Lord, we just come before you right now and we say in agreement that this will be so because you've spoken it into our hearts and our lives this day under your open heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.